Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. This is GearFest 2021, and we have some very special guests joining us today. This is Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. It's great to have you guys here at GearFest. Great, great to be here. So, hundreds of awards and nominations. I think you guys have the most nominations for a Grammy Producer of the Year. 100 gold, platinum, multi-platinum, diamond albums. I mean, incredibly successful careers. And uh, I noticed that you're actually celebrating your 35th anniversary of, of working on music together. Actually, we're celebrating actually more than that, but 35 years we're celebrating since uh, we did the Control album. Oh, okay. Which, is, which may be where everybody knows us, but if you want to go back a little before that, the very first Time album was 40 years ago. Wow, okay. Okay. I know everybody just feels a lot older right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of the celebration is you guys are actually releasing your first album as artists, and it'll be dropping on uh, July 10th. And uh, I know you've been uh, teasing that a little bit with some singles. You just released one with, uh, with Mariah Carey. Tell us about Jam and Lewis Volume 1 and uh, everything that's going into that production. Okay, well, that's the 35-year relevance. Before we made the Control album, um, we had been fired from the time, or as Terry likes to say, freed from the time <laughs> by Prince. And uh, so we just decided we would start doing our, our own album. And uh, in the middle of that, the offer came to do what ended up becoming the Control album. So when we finished the album, we did, recorded it in Minneapolis. When we thought the album was done, we had John McClain, who was the A&R person at A&M Records, come up to listen. So he listens to the songs and we play him Control and Nasty and When I Think of You and Pleasure Principle. And we're playing all these songs. And he goes, like all a &R people, he goes, I just need one more. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I just need one more song. So we get in the car. Terry puts a cassette in. And he says, listen to this. This is from our album. The third track in, he says, that's the one I need for Janet. I said, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, give it to Janet. He says, if she likes it, she can have it. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so anyway, the next day we go to the studio. We put the song on. Janet listens to it. She says, when it gets done, she says, who's that for? And we said, well, you if you want it. And she said, oh, I want it. That song became, what have you done for me lately? Uh -huh. So basically the song that launched her career and basically ended our album, our Jam and Lewis album. <laughs> so over the 35 years since then, we would get with different artists and we'd say, hey, we're, we're making an album. Would you like to do something for the album? And they'd go, yes. And when we'd finish, they'd go, Oh, I got to keep this for myself. So we finally, three years ago, we got selfish. Uh, we went into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. And when they asked us what hadn't we done that we still wanted to do, we looked around, we saw Babyface standing there and Babyface went in the same year we did. And we said, well, well we never got around to working with Babyface. We said, we never finished our Jam and Lewis album that we had started 30, you know, at that point, 30 years ago or whatever it was. And I said, and we never toured. So those are the three things playing our own song. So those were the three things. So we check off the box now with Babyface because his single is out currently from our album. Our album is done. And actually, June ni July 9th is the actual release okay, date. Okay, sorry about end. that. Yeah. That's okay. No no worries. Um, but you can get it on July 10th. It's all good. Or 11th or 12th. <laughs> It'll still be available, right? Um, exactly. That's all going to be good. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the journey of the album. Um, um, and, and we're finally you know, done and completed. So that's the kind of 35 year story of the journey of, of getting to a Jam and Lewis album. Finally. Right, right, that's amazing. So how different is it working on songs for yourselves versus working on songs for other artists? It's been quite the same process because we're including other artists. So it's pretty much the same process. Um, sometimes takes a, a little longer in COVID of course, but the process is still the same. Right, right. So I want to take you guys back to a, a, a very early thing that I read from you and, and get your thoughts on this. There's a story that you guys released a single and it was played on a radio station in Detroit. And when the DJ asked who the artist was, uh, people thought it was Prince. And your response was, we need to come up with a way to have our own sound. Now, how do you develop your own sound? I mean, that's something that so many people watching this video are gonna be interested in. How do I get my own sound? So what did you do to develop the Jam and Lewis sound? Well, I think the Jam and Lewis sound is very simply the sound of the artists sounding their best. So the way we approached it was, we always looked at it like we were tailors making a suit for somebody. Um, 
you can grab a great suit and it looks very nice on you off the rack, or you can have a suit that's custom made for you. When you do that, that suit is a suit that only fits you. So that's the analogy to the music we make. But we always thought as an artist, we would always want to make, or as producers, we would always want to make the artists have their own sound. So when we did, um, I remember some of the first records, we did SOS Band, Just Be Good to Me. We gave them a sound, but it was based on the homework we had done on the records they had had out before. And then we said, that's kind of keep that sound that they have, which was like a repetitive bass line, but using like glockenspiel bells and like maybe different textures and that, like that was the kind of thought process. So SOS would sound like SOS. The tough thing was when SOS band hit big with that, just be good to me. Then all the record companies came to us and said, oh man, give me one just like that. And we had to kind of go, no, no, that's SOS's sound. We're going to do something different. So then we did a song called Encore by Cheryl Lynn, which had a whole different sound. We'd use different drum machine. Terry played live bass on it as opposed to synth uh, bass. All of those things were different. And we kind of did that with each of the acts going on. And then when SOS Band got back to doing their next album, then we pulled out the 808 drum machine and we pulled out all of the things that we had used in that first SOS Band record. So for us, it was important for each of the artists to have their own sound and to have their best, uh, you know, to sound like their best selves. Just an aside, when the Babyface record came out, that's our single from our album, um, came out, somebody said, doesn't sound like Jam and Lewis. And we said, what does it sound like? And they said, it sounds like Babyface. We said, that's what it's supposed to sound like. <laughs> the whole idea of our album is each of the artists should sound the most like themselves they can possibly sound. So it's a compliment. Like, I think it was maybe like a criticism, but for us, we took it like a compliment. If you listen to our Babyface song and say, man, that's the most Babyface sounding record we've heard in years, then we've accomplished exactly what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So how much research, if you will, goes, goes into that when you're going to work with an artist on a, on a project? Tell us about that process. Well, the greatest part of working on any pro project with an uh, artist is we're fans of the people that we work with. And um, that comes first. Like, we've been asked to do some things over the years that we didn't think we were the best people for. So we, were, we would refer other people to do those things that we thought were better. But the artists that we ultimately choose to work with, we feel like we're the best people for the job. And we're fans of those particular artists. So that the recon we do of listening to what they've done recently, what they've done historically, and then some kind of way reaching a, a concept that kind of is, is coherent in what we believe would be the best record for them. If we were as a fan, we want to create that record. I, and by the way, I think it's, I think an analogy is always like a chef. Like, you know, if you, if I go to a restaurant, I'm not a chef obviously, but if I go to a restaurant and I eat something, I can say, Ooh, I love the way this tastes. But if you're a chef and you taste it, you go, yeah, and the reason you love it is because of the paprika or because of the something or the hint of something. Like, they can really dissect it. So when Terry says we're fans, yeah, we're fans. So we listen to the artist but we're, and we're fans of, but then we dissect what it is in that formula that made that, those particular records successful. And the best compliment we ever got was um, we worked with Barry White. And I remember we did this song with Barry White. And I remember, I think I did the demo vocal for it. And I'm on there singing, trying to be like Barry White. I'm like, oh, baby, I'm trying to do all this crazy stuff. And when we played the song for Barry, at first he didn't say anything. And we said, oh, Mr. White, uh, what do you think? And he just reared back and laughed in this big voice. He just said, oh, ha, ha, ha. sounds like me. <laughs> it was the greatest compliment we could ever have. Sounds like me. When an artist says that to us because we've done our homework and we figured out the things that work, the key they sing in, the kind of orchestration they like, the arrangements they like, if we've nailed that in the right way, that's kind of the sentiment that the artists have. And so that's what we try to do. We pride ourselves on doing that. We think that's one of our strengths for sure. Sure, sure. Do you ever run into a situation where the artist says, I want something completely different. I want you to take me in a new direction. Let's break some new ground. Actually, later on today, we're going to go see Mary J. Blige's uh, documentary, um, which is I'm excited to see. But Mary J. is one of the artists on our album. And it was funny because when we first started working with Mary, this is a while back. This was following up the My Life album, which is one of the greatest albums of all time in our estimation. But the follow up to that album was tough because, you know, where do you go from that? And we played her things that we thought were in a different direction. 
And she basically said, no, nah. she said, I'm not really feeling that. I'm not really feeling that. And we said, well, what do you want? And she said, something that sounds like me. <laughs> and we said, oh, okay. And so that to us meant you wanted something that was based on a sample loop, maybe from an old R&B recording. And then we will write because she was, you know, the queen of hip hop soul. So that was that kind of marriage of hip hop sampling and that and with vocal with R&B vocals. And we came up with a song called Love Is All We Need. And when we put the track on, it was an old Rick James loop. We put the track on and she started dancing around the room and she said, oh, this is what I'm talking about. So I think the the artists do a lot of times want to go in different directions. Sometimes it's just a matter of kind of got, keeping them in the in the guide rails, I guess you would you would say. Leon Silvers III, who was one of the producers that mentored us early on in our careers, he always used to say, it's okay to be different, just not different yuck. <laughs> so we just want to make sure people don't go different yuck just for the sake of being different. So tell us a little bit about working with, with these artists. You've, uh, most of the artists you've mentioned there are known for their vocals. And uh, of course, one of the big challenges when you're producing an album is getting a great vocal take. And uh, if you would share with us some of the techniques you have for capturing a great vocal take from an artist. So first you're gonna have a great microphone. And I'd say um, that's a microphone of your choice. Everybody has a different microphone and every microphone sounds different on every different voice. So then you start to establish your vocal chain, what kind of compressor you're gonna use um, and what kind of a preamp that you're gonna use. Um, we don't use anything especially crazy. We've always done very standard vocal chains. But for me, the biggest part of preparing for the vocal is just making the artist comfortable and kind of knowing what you wanna get out of the vocal and then knowing the level that you want to try to push the vocalist to. It goes without saying that you, you don't know what you're going to get on any given day, but you have an idea of the level of, of performance you can get out of any artist. And from that point on, for me, what I always do is try to get them to, to perform because what comes from the heart reaches the heart and try not to get too technically involved. Like we have a, a great melody already established because that comes in the songwriting portion of it. And we just try to follow that as closely as we can, but add all the different inflection and, and feelings that the artist wants to uh, give up at that particular time. So that, that brings to mind a, a quote I saw from, from you guys where you said that memorable songs don't need to be complicated, they need to be genuine. What does that mean? I don't remember that quote, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a, sounds like a ha happy quote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a good one for sure. Um, I think we always go for the feel of a song when we, I don't know whether this is directly relates to it, but I know when we're listening in a studio, we always say we're, we're basically listening for mistakes during the process of recording. We're listening for mistakes. At the certain point when we can hear the song and not hear the mistakes anymore, but it just feels really good, then even if something's wrong, if a note's a little off or the timing of something's a little off, we just say we're good because now it's giving us the feel that we want the song to give us. So I think the, the other thing about being a producer and Terry kind of touched on it also um, when he said, make the vocalist feel comfortable because Terry's vocal master, I call Terry vocal master. And I remember when we were doing, um, we had a number one song with Usher called you remind me. And I remember that when Usher sang the song initially, he was singing it from a demo that somebody had done and he was trying to sing it like the demo. And so they asked, would he go back and re-sing it again? L.A. Reid said, would you redo the song? And Usher said, I'm not going to re-sing the song unless it's with Terry Lewis, because he knew Terry could get that vocal out of him. And Terry's process of getting the vocal was almost having to unprogram him or unteach him what he had learned to sing the vocal and make him embrace it as an Usher, like sing it like yourself. But the artists sometimes need guidelines to figure out how to sing like themselves, so to speak. Hmm. And that was something that Terry was able to figure out. So, um, but making it, making the artist comfortable is the thing. And it becomes, production is, it's, it's some technical, but a lot of it is, you know, it's like coaching, I guess. Like, you don't, some players you have to ride really hard. Some you have to just compliment, but it's a human thing. It's really about the humanity and about the relationship to me in getting a great vocal because there has to be trust. The artist has to trust that, you're going to get that out of them 
And when you play it back for them, they're going to go, wow, that sounds really great. And that's, that's always the nicest thing when that happens. Right, right. It sounds like with uh, the many references you've made here and just looking back at your careers and, and some of the things that you've, you've worked in, you guys seem to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the, the, all the different genres of music and different artists and things in, in, a, in a very wide range. Is that something you purposefully studied or how did that come about? A lot of that comes about just from where we were raised. In Minneapolis, in order to participate in playing places, you had to know how to play multiple styles of music. You couldn't just be one dimensional. Because you know, one given night you might play at a club, they want you to play blues. Or we play at the Nacarima and we do four sets of a uh, combination of jazz, blues, and R&B. And then we play at a ski resort and they want you to play top 40 and maybe some polkas. So we had multiple styles going on at the same time, all the time. And we lived in an environment where there was not one main source of radio for us because in, in Minneapolis, the R&B station was sun up to sun down at KUXL. So you would pick up and you listen to some soft rock or you some, some pop. Um, it, we were just influenced by everything. So it, all, it helped us to become better musicians and to appreciate music of all styles. Right. Right, yeah. Yeah, that, that depth is apparent. And uh, the other aspect to that is your depth as musicians. You're both multi-instrumentalists. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, what do you feel that brings to your production and your songwriting? I just think it's tools. It's all different things that you can do. It also gives you a, a understanding of musicians. It's interesting because Terry, we were talking about this the other day. A lot of times on a record, Terry wouldn't play the bass. I'd play the bass on it, um, just on a keyboard or something. But Terry would say, if I played a certain part or a certain guitar part that was more of a keyboard type of thing, and he would say, guitar player wouldn't play it like that, or bass player wouldn't play it like that, or something. So he kept me very honest, uh, you know, in my playing. Even uh, we were talking the other day, also that like records that people know, like If by Janet, which everybody says, man, who played guitar on that song? And it's like, mm, well, it's just a keyboard, I, I guess me, <laughs> but it's a key keyboard. But the idea was that if you could fool guitar players with a keyboard guitar part, because it's always apparent to me when I hear something and I go, that's somebody on a keyboard. That's not a real instrument. But we were able to fool people. But anyway, just having that musical knowledge, I think just it just helps. You know, um, it doesn't mean you have to be a musician to do what you do. But for us, it's always been great. Right. So let's talk a little bit about songwriting. Uh, you guys are, are uh, obviously contributing songs to the projects that you work on and things. Are you writing all the time? Are you, we'll say, project-based songwriters? Or how does, a, how does a song come to be for you guys? That's a good question and pretty accurate in your, your summation of it. Like, we do it all different ways. Like, I think we're always writing or conceiving, which is part of writing. We're always listening, reading, and writing down concepts. Then the application comes when there's a purpose for it. So there's an artist that needs a song, we take it from there and start a creative, a creative process from there. So um, the artist inspires the style we write the song in, basically, because that's part of the tailoring to that particular artist's abilities and strengths. That's kind of how we've always done it. And I can't even remember when the last time I just wrote a song for no reason, just full song out without with someone in mind. I can't, I can't even remember back mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a while. So do you start with the lyrics or do you start with the music or you'd mentioned starting from loops uh, with uh, Ray J. Blige or is there a process there? It's all different processes. Um, it can be, you know, we used to have what we called the book of titles. Um, and now it's, I guess it's the iPhone of titles, I guess. But whenever we would hear somebody say a phrase that we liked or a line that we liked, or a lot of times we'd go to a movie and there would be a line in a movie that we'd go, Ooh, that's a good line or something. You know, we always put those down and we just call it, you know, the book of titles, like I say. So that's always the beginning of something, but generally, it's generally the track comes first and then we write the melody and the, um, the lyrics around kind of what the track is in general. But we've done it all kind of different ways. What's great about it is that we have the freedom to do whatever we want to do. We basically we did this, and I'll just I'll just say this: we did a handshake uh, 
it'll be uh, 40 years ago um, next year. And the handshake was very basic. It was like, everything we do is 50-50. And what that did is it eliminated all of the things in songwriting that you would argue about. Oh, that's my bridge. Well, no, that's my title. Well, that's my melody. Or, you know, you take all of that away. So we never had those discussions. And that takes away about 99% of anything you'd ever argue about. And we always say we've never had an argument. Terry and I have never had an argument because we never, I never want to win something that Terry loses at and vice versa with him. So, but what we say is we have disagreements. Now a disagreement is different because a disagreement is something you can try to solve. And for us, it's not whether it's my way or his way, it's what's the best way. So if we can come to the agreement, we're trying to find the best way to do something, that's the way we do it. And so that's the way we approach really everything that we do, production, songwriting, just living life, you know, period. Um, but that's our philosophy and that's worked uh, really well. And, and the other philosophy I would say we've had is 35 years ago when we did Control, uh, there was a guy, a John Bream, who's a columnist for the Minneapolis, of the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. And he said, um, hey, you, see, you guys are the hottest producers. And we said, well, we don't really want to be hot. We just want to be warm for a long time. <laughs> so, so 30 years after that, five years ago, we released a record with Janet um, called Unbreakable. And the album, you know, entered at number one. The single was like 12 weeks number one on the R&B charts. And he said, how does it feel to still be having number one records after all these years? And we said, well, we told you in the first place, warm for a long time. That was the goal. So, you know, with our new album, we're just trying to stay warm. That's it. We're, just, we're still keeping the same philosophy. Right. Right. That's awesome. That's awesome. So as you, as you create the songs and you, and you put them together, how, um, how deep do you go into the demoing process and the arranging process before you present it to the artist? Not at all, really. We do it. We try to do it with the artist around. Um, and we never really do demos. It's, it's, funny, it's funny. It's kind of a joke with Clive Davis. I remember Clive Davis always used to say to us, you know, um, hey, I got a new Aretha record we're working on or a Whitney record. You guys do some demos and whatever. And we'd be like, Clive, we don't do demos. <laughs> whatever we could record, that is the record because the demos are always better to me. So now we, when we built our own studio, which was one of the smart things that we did, was we built our own studio um, back in 85, I think it was. That was the reason we did it. So that anything we demoed was going on at that point in time, analog tape, and it was done professionally. Um, so that the demos were the actual recordings. So for us, it's always getting in the room with somebody, talking with them, figuring out what they want to talk about, and then making that record with them. So we created most of the songs on our album all in one place and all with everybody together with their ideas and input because it's about collaboration. Right. So I'm curious, you, you mentioned, of course, the, the hits you've had through all the decades and, and continuing on today. How do you see your productions and your songwriting, at, your songwriting as having evolved through those years? I would like to think we're better at it. I, I, I hope. I mean, who knows? I, I think we know more so we can do more. Um, but I mean, it's hard for me to judge. I will say that it's interesting looking back and listening to songs that we did in the past, because like I say, we always are listening for the mistakes. And literally songs that are more recent, we still hear the mistakes when we listen to them. So we never can really listen to with the ears of someone that's just hearing it and appreciating it. But I will say some of the older songs that we've done, you know, the 30 plus year ago songs, sound pretty good um, to us because now we can listen with kind of fresh ears. And sometimes our enjoyment of the song also has to do with the, the um, what would I call it? The experience of making the song. You know, sometimes there's songs that the way the song turned out maybe wasn't that great, but the experience of working with that particular artist was amazing, you know? Um, so then, and that happens. And sometimes it's a tough, you know, you know, in the studio or whatever, and it doesn't go really well but then the song becomes successful. So I think what we do now is we kind of hear it through other people's ears. When other people say to us, oh, I love this song, this song changed my life or whatever those things are, we kind of just accept that and go, thanks, that's, that's great. But hopefully we've gotten better at what we've done. I do, I do know we feel with our album, we couldn't have made this album 10 years ago, 20 years ago, not in the way we were able to make it now, just with the knowledge that we have. 
Right. So uh, through those uh, all those productions through the years, one of the things that stands out to me is that your productions never sound dated. Even when you go back 30 years or, or uh, you know, and listen to some of the early productions through to today, they, they still sound fresh and they still sound current. Do you go in and say, you know what, this is the cool thing of today. We're not going to do that because we know in five years it's going to sound like it's dated today. Or, or how, do you, how do you keep them sounding fresh through, uh, through all these years? Yeah, I think that's just perspective, though. And, you know, that's a great question because I don't think we just knowingly do anything is that I think we instinctive, instinctively do things. Like case in point, the keyboards are the keyboards. A bass is a bass. The melodies are the melodies. How the artist delivers it is how they deliver it. Now, everybody doesn't use that keyboard, that tool the same. And I think the way jam textures things, and I think the way that we arrange songs kind of just fits. It doesn't, it, it has a classic nature, but when the technology comes along and the way we integrate it, we make it a part of it so that it's in there enough, but not in there enough to be dated or new or whatever, it just feels good. And like Jam said earlier, that's what we try to achieve is what feels good. And what feels good today usually feels good tomorrow. Some stuff relies totally on the technology or the cadence of the vocal or rhythm of the day, you know, whatever the um, music of the month is, and that feels dated later on. But we never approach it like that. We just kind of just make music based on who the artist is and what ingredients that we want to add based on what we think is the best palette for that artist to paint on. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, Jimmy and I were talking before the cameras were rolling and I actually visited you guys at flight time up uh, Oh, too many years ago for me to mention. You you sort of minimized gear there, but man, you guys had a huge collection of gear in in those days, and I'm assuming it it continues to th this day. Talk a little about what gear means to your productions and what the essentials are that you feel you have to have to create music. Yeah, we still do have all of our gear, which is great. We love that. I remember we were working with the artist Robin a few years back, and she said. Um, Man, it'd be great if there was a if we had an 808. And Terry was like, "Oh yeah, we got an 808." <laughs> it's like it was pretty much like anything you could you could name. Uh, we have, but we also have the you know emulations of those in in soft sense, right? So we can pull out an OB8 Oberheim synthesizer for real, or we can go into the software version of it, you know, in a computer. But it's just kind of good to have all of those different tools, like I say, um, to work with. I will say in the early days. Um, in the early days, I mean like the early 80s. Um, to me, keyboards for me were the most important ingredient um, because I would always, I was never the person that when somebody would say, oh, this keyboard's really great if you get in there and start tweaking the sounds. I never wanted to tweak sounds. I wanted to put a keyboard up and flip through the presets. And if the presets inspired songs, like if I hit a certain sound and all of a sudden it caused me to start writing music, um, then I knew it was great. And, you know, that's how, you know, going back to Janet, you know, control, a lot of that was the Mirage synthesizer mm -hmm. or the Mirage uh, a keyboard back in that day, which people didn't, a lot of people didn't really like. But for me, I was like, oh man, I love this. Listen to this sound. And that's the way Nasty, the song Nasty happened. It was just like plugging it in, putting a, a, a floppy disk in it that day and coming up with those sounds. And then it's like, when I heard the sounds, it's like, oh, I know what to do with this. And you start playing a melody that, you know, kind of works. But that kind of stuff happened. So I remember the DX7 back in that day, the um, OB8, as I mentioned earlier, which goes back to the Prince days, which is always a go-to for us. You know, and then over the years, like I say, we would always acquire new keyboards and we try to assign different keyboards for different artists, so to speak, so that we kept the sound fresh and different. And the same with drum machines. But it was always kind of the evolution of gear. And so we never were... You know, we always had our favorites and our kind of our go-to things, but we never, but we never stopped looking for new things. And Terry, I, I give a lot of the credit for that for Terry. Terry was, even when we were still analog recording, Terry had some of the first like recording software in his computer and his laptop and stuff to do stuff. And eventually that turned into, you know, Pro Tools and, and Logic and all the, the stuff that we use now. But he had the early versions of it, and I kept going, Terry, that stuff's never going to work, man. What are you, you're crazy. But he just was like, no, no, it's going to work. Trust me. 
And then I remember we got a Synclav, which was all hard disk. That was the first hard disk recording that was done. And I remember how revolutionary that was. And the idea that there's not even going to be tape at all. And forget even digital tape. We kind of skipped the digital tape and went straight into the hard disk recording. So we always, the, the technology and the gear was always very important, but we still have every bit of gear that we can reach back to, um, to record, which is great. Yeah, it's a tremendous library yeah. of equipment to draw from. Yeah, it, it is. But I think the saving grace in it all was the equipment that we didn't buy. <laughs> Because it allowed us to actually understand the equipment that we have better. You can have 10 hammers, all of them do different things, but you only need two. You need a soft hammer and a hard hammer <laughs> and one that pulls out nails and then you're good. So we bought enough equipment to have diversity, but we kept the focus mostly on the music and the concept and the artist. And then we applied that technology to that part of it. So is not wasting energy on things, I think is so important. Right, right. Uh, speaking of gear, I do have to call out Roland. They, uh, they facilitated us uh, having the two of you join us here at, at Gear Fest and we're very grateful to them. And I know you guys go back quite a ways with Roland. My very first uh, <clears throat> synthesizer was a SH-1000 Roland back in, I think, yeah, in the, it was late 70s, I'll just put it like that. And. Uh, <laughs> I used to wear it around my neck because I always wanted, they didn't, they hadn't really made keytars yet. I think Moog had the Liberation, which I had one of those, but I just, I couldn't afford it. So I got the synthesizer and I put uh, screws on the end and put a guitar strap on it. The thing weighed a ton, but I'd run, run around with that. That was like my kind of go-to thing. But then um, the 808 drum machine was like revolutionary to us. The other thing was over the years, you know, we were fortunate to get a lifetime achievement award from Roland. And it was funny because at the ceremony, I actually brought my first synthesizer, which was all banged up at that point, And I brought our first 808 drum machine because I wanted to show people that, you know, literally Roland has been a part of our lifetime right, in our careers. Um, and they've been great partners with us and, and great friends. But even more than that, uh, great equipment, obviously. But also to me, they've been great in looking out for the overall music uh, creators, people that create music. And I, I also think that there's a disconnect that happens sometimes, you know, the software manufacturers about, you know, they have brilliant minds that are creating these things, but a lot of times they're almost in a vacuum, like they're creating these things, but it's like, no, talk to the people that are using the things because they're, they're going to give you a different perspective on what it is you're creating. Um, and I think Roland was very good at asking people, how do you like this? What do you think about this? Can we do this better? What would you do with it? You know, and those types of things. So I think that relationship for us has been, you know, absolutely wonderful. So I can't say enough good things about it. That's wonderful. Yeah. I was actually at that Lifetime Achievement Award ceremony when they, when they gave that to you. It was very cool. Very cool honor. So, so you saw that big piece of junk I had around me. I did see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was cool. That was cool. So I, I, we're, we're so grateful for your time today. I just have a couple of quick questions here and we'll, we'll wrap things up, but maybe they're not easy questions, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so my first question is, you guys have seen the industry change pretty dramatically from uh, the time when you started to today. What advice do you have for someone who wants to get into the industry as a producer and a songwriter? I think I, the, the thing I always say um, is, and it sounds cliche, but I always say be prepared. And what I mean by be prepared is I hear a lot of people a lot of times if we go around and, and speak to kids or we speak to students or whatever, and they say, I'm waiting for my break. And we always say, okay, waiting for your break, we should get rid of the word waiting and we should put the word preparing in there. I'm preparing for my break. Now the preparation for the break can be, you know, studying, Everything now is on the internet. So you have a band that you really like and you'd really like to either emulate what they do or whatever. Well, you can find out all the information. You can listen to all their music. You can find out their management. You can find out their attorney, their record company, their A&R person. You can find everybody that's kind of in their infrastructure, what they do, what kind of gear they like to use, kind of guitar they play, the gauge strings that they put on the guitar. Like you can find all that out. And that's what I mean by preparing. Now, if you ever come across that band and maybe they say to you, you say to them, oh, I'm a guitar player or whatever, and they go, well, let, let me hear something. Now you're prepared to actually play something 
You know what I'm saying? As opposed to like, oh, well, I don't have my gear with me today and I'm not, you know, that kind of thing. A lot of times if somebody says they're a singer, we'll say, sing something. And they, a lot of times they'll be like, oh, well, I don't, my throat today. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, you know, here's the opportunity. So I just think preparation is, you know, what is it, preparation and opportunity or whatever, that's what luck is or something. I'm not saying it right, but that's kind of what it, So that's why to me, I think preparation is, is the main key to getting anywhere that you want to go, production or any other part of the music industry. Another thing to add to that would be just studying, knowing the, uh, the parts of the process that you want to be a part of, um, knowing what you're supposed to do. If, if, you, if you want to play chess, I'm um, just giving an analogy, you can't use checker rules because the two do not mix. You have to know what the players do and why the players do what they do why the queen moves a certain way, why the king moves a certain way, what the knights do. You have to know the rules of the game. And then from there, you have to assess what you want to get out of it and approach it from that way. Because, um, you know, just having conversations with people, it, I, I, I get frustrated because I think people put too much emphasis on probably the wrong things. Like, is it, you know, someone taking advantage of you or you're getting, uh, you know, or you're taking advantage of them. So I always say fair is where you heard a little bit and I heard a little bit. So case in point, if I'm trying to go into a record deal and I'm, you know, I'm all knowledgeable because I've been on the internet and I've studied, I know what the greatest record deal is and I'm supposed to get that deal. First of all, no one knows the outcome. So when I bring my music, I have to have a great attitude about my music, but my music might not be all that to the person that I'm bringing it to. So when you're making a deal, that person might not want to give you what you think your value is because you should always have a consideration of what your value is. Okay. But if that person has something to offer me to get me to a point that I want to get to in terms of promotional uh, abilities and access, how much is it worth for me to give up to gain that access? I have to know that. I have to figure that part of it out. So it's just knowing how the pieces work and, and knowing that one song can make you or break you, but you should never be broken because we do it for the music. Okay. It, 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 but that attitude is that that one song can make you or break you. Is, it's kind of a bad attitude. You have to give some to get some. So just be ready and know what you want to give and offer for what you're willing to accept or get. Right, right. Lots of great advice there. Thank you very much. So I'm curious after uh, now, as you head into your, your 40th anniversary, if you will, what keeps you guys fresh? What keeps you excited about music? Well, the music itself, I think. Um, yes. Um, and the... And the artists that, that are making it, you know, the discovery process is great. There's a lot of new music that we're discovering that we love and a lot of new artists that we love. And also, uh, honestly, the thing that excites me most every day is um, getting a chance to work with Terry. Having that person that you trust, that you love, that you can bounce ideas off of, crazy ideas or, you know, whatever that is. Um, I just love the process of that. And so music is the thread that keeps us together, you know, along with respect and all of those types of things. But I think the way I look at it now is uh, first times. The thing that keeps life exciting is those first time things that happen, those first time experiences. And so for the first time, we're doing an album as artists. So that's exciting to me. And I, we re I reminded the record company the other day when the Babyface record went to, into the top five, and they said, oh, you're top five this week, uh, but you got a, got a lot of those. And I said, not as artists. No, no. I said, this is, this is all new for us. So each thing is new. So I think as we get later in life to still have the excitement of having first times, um, I think is, is very much appreciated. So I'm kind of in that mode right now. I'm loving all the first times that are happening for us right now. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, mine is pretty much the same. Working with Jam is a, a, a joy, you know. And what comes out of that joy is the freedom to create. You know, and one thing about creation, creation creates creation. It's, it's 
it feeds itself. It's like, you just want to do more. And the journey is the most important part of that creation. And I always say, I hope I, I, I never arrive, uh, arrive at the destination because I wouldn't even know what to do. I'm, I'm just enjoying the, des- the, 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 the conversation and the moving of it and hope I never uh, reach that destination. Just keep creating out of the creation. I love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So my last question for you is, um, it's it's almost easier to list artists you haven't worked with than artists you have worked with. And obviously, you guys are great artists yourselves as well, and producers and songwriters. What is it that makes a great artist? Wow, that's way too <laughs> that's way too broad. I will say that um, there's certain. I mean, we call it the it factor. There's certain artists that just have it that in any generation they would have been. You know, I would call them generational artists. You know. Uh, we have an, you know, an album that just came out. Uh, what part of is uh, the, the artist Her, who is, I think, 23 years old. And she's one of those artists that in any generation of time would have been one of the top artists. And actually, our record with her uh, is actually uh, number one this week. So um, it's, it's an amazing journey, as Terry says. But I think for us, I, I always have to make the distinction with a great artist because Sometimes great artists are great artists and I look at them and love what they do. Sometimes artists are great artists and I look at them and go, oh, I want to write a song for them or I want to produce them. It's kind of two different things. Um, But we admire everybody that's out there trying to do it. And most of all, we just we love music. We just love what it is. So whether it's good, bad, whatever, that's opinion. As I love Terry saying, he, he always says that. There's three kinds of music. There's good, there's bad, and there's hits. <laughs> the first two you can argue about. It's subjective. The hit part, if it's a hit, it's a hit. Nobody argue. That's a fact. <laughs> a hit is a fact. So we've had a few of all three of those in that in those categories, but um, I think the artists are the ones that make it happening. And hopefully whatever those elements that make a great artist is, we've helped to maybe add you know, to that and the people that we've been able to produce over the years. Excellent. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real honor to have you here at, at GearFest 2021. We hope we can get you here to Sweetwater in person at, at some point. It'd be uh, it'd be great to, to not have to do this remotely. You guys are in Nashville right now. <laughs> we are in Nashville for the opening of the National, the National Museum of African American Music. There we go. It's such an honor to do that. Um, it's an honor to speak to you today. Um, it's an honor to be a part of GearFest. Hopefully people that are there making music. Uh, we appreciate what Sweetwater does because you're making it available. I told you, my son, I see I see bills from Sweetwater all the time <laughs> as he's creating music. It's like, Dad, I got these stands from Sweetwater. I got these speakers from Sweetwater. I got this. From... It's like, okay, great. Thanks, you know, Max. So anyway, well, we appreciate it's all good, that man. Too. But it, it's great, man. But I, And hopefully, yeah, when next time we do Gear Fest, it'll be in person and everybody stays safe. That'll be wonderful. Right. Well, we'll look forward to it, and we are very excited about Jam and Lewis Volume 1, which drops on July 9th. I got the date right, on July 9th, and uh, the singles are out now. There's, there's uh, uh, several of the songs that you can check out now, but the album's going to hit, and hopefully uh, you guys will take that on the road as well. That's the third thing on our plan, right? The, the, the Work with Babyface, do the album, and then take it on the road. So once again, when it's safe to do that, that's something we plan on doing. Look forward to meeting everybody out on the road. We'll look forward to it. Thanks again, guys. Take care. Take care. Thank you. And thank you for joining me. This has been GearFest 2021. We have been honored to share some time with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Sweetwater.